Hello, my geeselings. This is going to be, I don't know, a fun introduction to record because it is a Russian doll of introductions. There's already a first introduction that I recorded a few months ago after doing this episode with Justin Clark Doan, who's a professor at Columbia. So I'm going to include that introduction after this one before the episode itself. First order of business, however, is addressing some complaints from the peanut gallery, aka my sister, who noticed in the last episode, episode six, that I had a drippy nose in the intro video. And you know what? My nose drips sometimes for all you peanut gallery listeners. And I am very far from perfect. And I decided as I was doing this podcast that no episode was going to be perfect and nothing I ever did was going to be perfect. And if I were waiting for that or demanded that, then no episodes would ever go out. So I will attempt to have a less drippy nose in the future to the extent that's under my control, but I don't really care that much. Second clarification here in my episode with Ronnie, AKA Robinson's dad in episode three, we talk about, or I talk about in my introduction, my uh, tomato allergy. And I think I tell a slightly different story in this version of the podcast or this episode of the podcast. And that's because the story is long and I sometimes omit certain parts when I tell it, but just to clarify the timeline a bit. So I've been allergic to tomatoes my entire life. A couple years ago, maybe three, I, I decided to pay for an allergy test out on my own dime. And I got my blood tested and it said that I wasn't allergic to tomatoes. But then upon my mother's advice, and she's a physician, she said I should see an actual doctor first before uh, just acting on the blood test alone. So I was waiting till I had health, good health insurance, which I got when I was at Columbia. But what prompted my actually seeing a physician was accidentally having having a Japanese barbecue sandwich, which I think I talk about in episode three's introduction. Okay, so that's been clarified. Now, last things before I get to the actual introduction of Justin Clark Doan. I wanted to mention a couple of things that I don't say in the introduction, which are emphasizing, I guess, how big or how bad my nerves were recording this. And I bungled some really simple things that made me feel quite dumb when I was sitting there with Justin, like some very rudimentary things about non and I can't even pronounce it now, about non-Euclidean geometry. And I st- misstated the twin prime conjecture. Uh, anyway, those things happen in a conversation, and especially when I had the camera on me. But typically, I mean, we see the people we look up to, the academics or the movie stars or whoever it is, in scenarios where everything they've they've done has been recorded and edited and vetted over and over. We're seeing the fi- final cut of the movie or the final cut of we're reading the final cut of the paper they've been working on for a year. But in real life, I don't think there are that many people who are uh, totally perfect. Witness my runny nose from the last episode. So anyway, I decided to put it out. And hopefully, uh, years from now, when I'm looking for my next job, they don't see that I totally bungled the twin, <laughs> the twin prime conjecture. So I also, I left in a lot of those gaffes partially at Justin's insistence, but okay, enough of this introduction. We will move to my stiffer earlier introduction before I was this butterfly in front of the camera that I've become now. And anyway, I hope you enjoy introduction number two. I hope introduction number one hasn't been too terrible. And I hope you enjoy uh, the episode that follows. This podcast is with Justin Clark Doan. Justin's a brilliant guy. 
He's a professor of philosophy at Columbia University, and he did his PhD at NYU, which is generally regarded as the strongest philosophy program in the country, and it's ridiculously difficult to get in there. So he recently wrote a book called Morality and Mathematics, and that's what we talk about during this podcast. I actually just came from a class with him in which we spoke about the ZFC axioms, forcing, and the continuum hypothesis. And these are all areas in the philosophy of mathematics and mathematical foundations. And it's amazing how fluidly he speaks about complex technical issues. So we recorded this podcast in his office and in person, obviously, and it was my first episode with what I've been calling a big fish. And just like he is in class, he he spoke very coherently on this difficult subject matter, whereas I, on the other hand, found myself extremely flustered by being in front of the camera. Uh, Obviously, nobody ever had to see it, but it felt at times like the entire world was watching me, and there were twice, two times, where I couldn't even finish my sentence. But afterwards, as I was debating whether or not this was even publishable, if because I thought I might just look pretty foolish, I realized, you know, Justin has been teaching this for 10 years, writing it, about it for 20 years. He just wrote a book on these topics. It would be pretty ridiculous to expect that I could talk about this material in anything resembling the manner that he could. So I decided I would put it out there anyways, because people might enjoy it. We had a really good conversation talking broadly about the topics that he, some of the topics that he covers in his book. So foundations of math, morality, and their intersection. A lot of it will probably be very difficult to understand if you don't have a background in either of those domains. I don't have a, a background in ethics or metaethics, uh, but even some of the mathematics he talks about is tough for me. But I don't think that that should stop you from listening to the episode, unless, of course, the topics really just don't interest you. But I listen to podcasts on physics or art or history that I really have no business listening to as an academic. But that doesn't mean that I don't still get a lot out of hearing experts talk about things outside my particular area. So I think you can still enjoy it. And my my favorite portion of the podcast actually was the last 20 minutes or so when we get to candy. So if that's more your speed, uh, feel free to skip listening to my voice until then and i hope you enjoy ice cream though yeah right what ice cream are you into i mean honestly um besides like setting aside just the objective facts about this um like i think that it really depends on the context um, okay. So no, that I mean, context specific ice cream is a thing. Yeah. So, so I mean, lately I've been having a lot of Rocky Road. Okay. But I. What is the context that calls for Rocky Road? So. So the context has been pizza. Often bagel bites. Um, okay. And uh, it just seems like the right thing to do. This, I'm, I'm pu- just pulling up my notes, but it's funny that you mentioned pizza because mm-hmm. I had my first slice of pizza ever about two weeks ago. That's, I don't know what to I know, say. I know, I know. How did that happen? I don't think that most people are prepared for me to tell them that. Well, why, why, would, that, why would that be the case? So, why it's the case is I was allergic to tomatoes as like an infant so they discovered that and a few times as i was a kid growing up i'd accidentally had tomatoes and would throw up so 
I just never got to eat tomatoes, and then I, de- I had some other food allergies, so everybody just always assumed I was allergic to tomatoes. Right. And then about two years ago, I got my got blood tested for allergies. Yeah. And the result for tomatoes came back equivocal. But I didn't have health insurance to get to follow up with a doctor and figure right. out what was actually going on. Right. But then I came to Columbia and got good health insurance. Right. And so they took me into the hospital after reviewing all my blood results. They put me in a special chamber monitored by a nurse and dosed out tomatoes. Like they I had to bring in tomatoes that's amazing. Yeah, and they cut them up into like 20 gram doses for the first. Like I took a 20 gram dose right. for and then they watched me for 30 minutes. Right. Then they gave me another dose and I was in there for like 3 hours and by the end of it I had eaten two really big tomatoes <laughs> and they checked my entire body for rashes. Uh-huh. They asked if I was nauseous, like all of these things and then right. I was allowed to eat tomatoes. Like medically cleared to eat tomatoes. So, but what's the explanation then of your childhood experience? Some people just outgrow I their see. allergies. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm still deathly allergic to cashews and pistachios. When you say deathly, you mean you throw up or worse? Um, I suppose the dose is pretty important okay uh, but i'm if i had 10 cashews i'd probably die i'd have like an anaphylactic shock you're kidding yeah but then other foods like avocados which i'm also allergic to i just would throw up so you're allergic to quite a few foods like you have to be careful four things okay four things but fairly common things cashews pistachios bananas and avocados bananas yeah wow yeah which is funny because i hate i don't know why i said i hate but i love artificially flavored banana things Uh, but i haven't i don't know what a real banana tastes like because i haven't had one since i was a baby because all the tests always came back that's amazing yeah wow so one question i had (laughs) written down for you yeah is how you manage to keep such beautiful hair Mm -hmm. right and we, we talked a little bit about this you said it was quarantine hair yeah, no, it's, I mean, um, I, honestly, I have a team and, <laughs> okay. uh, you know, it takes a village. Um, but, uh, no, I, um, it's, uh, it's I just, head and shoulders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's, um, suave or what's the, what's the one that, so uh, the Walmart anyway. Um, no, it's just, I, I, I get lazy and then I have long hair for four years and then I have short hair for four years. So I had long hair throughout middle school and high school until I had to cut it for a part in a play. And then I had short hair until the end of college um, when I grew it out again. And then I worked in like the middle of nowhere in the White Mountains of New Hampshire and I decided that I was just gonna cut all my hair off in the mountains. And so that's what I did before I came to grad school on a Greyhound bus to New York City where I'd never been. That's romantic. I don't think romantic was what the word that was in my head at the time but um that's nice of you to say yeah um anyway so yeah i guess i don't know i think yeah it's like i didn't have to see anybody so i felt like uh i don't have to worry about looking good so i just let my hair grow out okay yeah well i'm very jealous of that hair i so you're the first person who's ever said that in 39 years okay well before i uh get back to ice cream and then philosophy right you know i've just recently become extremely filled with existential dread about receding hairlines <laughs> and so yeah okay uh, receding hairlines are great ice cream rocky yeah. road i also just recently had rocky road mm-hmm. i don't know why i think are there typically walnuts in them? There are. Yeah, so I thought I might have been allergic to walnuts, but then my testing uh, allowed me to eat them. Oh, great. So, okay. But So you like a chocolate base on your ice cream. Well, yeah, so what do I want to say about this? Um, Only in certain contexts? There, yeah, it's, it's basically an objective truth that chocolate is better than vanilla as a base i say basically because i can imagine like really out there scenarios but um so yeah the short answer is yes but um what's funny is that you're already presaging a discussion about uh obviousness and mathematics and the axioms because we're both presumably experts on ice cream but i would 
argue very strongly to the contrary that vanilla is vastly superior to chocolate as oh, a base. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. So this is very much like the axiom of choice or something. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know how it goes with the axiom of choice. People throw up their hands and say, okay, I'll, you know, it's to each his own. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. Now I will guide us closer yeah. to philosophy. So how did you get interested in philosophy and mathematics? Um, yeah, so uh, not, I mean, not, there was nothing inevitable about it. I, um, uh, I let's just put it this way. I was not a serious student uh, uh, growing up, and but sort of at the end of high school, I kind of had this, I don't know how to put it, you know, I was trying to like redefine myself and put myself in a new path and, uh, and, you know, went from like kind of remedial classes to, um, trying to catch up on everything. So I, 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 that was in high school. That was in high school. So I saw, I saw in that interview that I read Mm. where that you said you got into some mischief. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so no, literally I, I, in my junior year of high school, I was in algebra. And by the way, I'm not talking about like super fancy schools either. Okay, I'm talking about public schools in rural Ohio. Uh, so, okay. so like high bar. Yeah, it, it, like you know. Yeah. So anyway, um, I uh, I was in algebra because I would sl- I would just sleep in the back if I went to class and um, and not go to class often, and I would n- you know never did my homework and stuff. So I would just get D's and everything. I just I just I really I honestly didn't know. To be fair, I honestly didn't know there was like anything to be gained from school. It was just, I just found it like mind numbingly boring. And, you know, I like, you know, it was at like 7 a.m. and I'm like nocturnal. And so, so I just, I honestly didn't know like that, you know, get good grades and there's something interesting at the end of the tunnel, you know? Um, so, so when I started to wonder and think about that, um, I, I, I actually skipped from junior year, I skipped from algebra to calculus. So I never took trigonometry or whatever else you're supposed to take. And, uh, and I loved calculus. So, you know, I, I, I'd never, you know, see, I didn't know what cosine meant and stuff, but I, but I learned that stuff obviously. And, um, and that'd be a real huge gap in your game if you still just had never <laughs> touched on cosine. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, for, except for the Pythagorean theorem, I'm really good at math. Um, but uh, no, I, um, I, uh, I loved calculus, and it was, you know, it was a, it wasn't like a hardcore calculus class or anything, but it was just so much more interesting than anything I'd taken. And I also took a class in in history. And the history class was a generic history class, but the person teaching it um, was just very passionate about it and also very clear about what it had to do with today. So he'd often bring in like articles from the Columbus Dispatch and be like, you know, link it to something we were reading. And so I got very interested in these two things, I guess you could say, but more importantly, I just got like my brain turned on and I got interested in like learning, you know. And um, it's not an overstatement to say, like, it started then. It started when I was, like, 17. I really, like, I, you know, like, you know, I wasn't reading books when I was a little kid and stuff. Like, I mean, this was not on the radar. And, you know, my friends, did the, uh, my close friends uh, growing up didn't go to college and stuff. And I assumed that I'd be in the same uh, sort of trajectory. And that was fine with me. I mean, I wasn't, like, down about that. I was going to probably play music and uh you know, maybe act, even though I hated it, but it was something that I was having success with. So, um, and then, you know, work at the Roadhouse Grill and, uh, and that was fine. But anyway, this opened up, this turned, turned me onto a new thing and I had no idea that it would go anywhere, but I just wanted to learn more. So, um, you know, it was a very rushed sort of thing, but I, you know, like randomly heard about this kind of like weirdo hippie college with, at the time it was like 600 students or something and no grades and no requirements and um it was it was originally founded as a private school but it was founded by a bunch of hippies so it immediately went bankrupt this is the new college of florida yeah it's called new college of florida um and 
so it was fa- it's, it, it's on the old Ringling estate, and I am Pei built the dorms. It was this like really cool progressive thing, but. As I say, it's a hippie school, so the planning wasn't great. And so it immediately went bankrupt. But the University of South Florida said, um, if you <clears throat> let us put some buildings on your campus, um, we'll acquire you as the honors college of the state system, and you can still have your weirdo school. So they like basically ate the debt of, of this school, New College of Florida. And it became a public school, but it remained the same old thing. And that sounded awesome to me, and I don't know why they let me in, but they let me in. I mean, it's not, you know, I, mean, I, uh, I didn't have an impressive transcript, shall we say. Um, but they let me in, and, uh, and, uh, and I loved that. And um, my first year, I studied three things uh, intensely. One of them was math. So I jumped right into, like, serious math, which was a big jump for me, but... but um, but was also really fascinating to me. Um, uh, like analysis, uh, there was like a kind of intro analysis class was the first class. Um, uh, and, then, um, and then I was also really interested on my own. I had discovered an interest in sort of Asian religious thought. And there was one person there who was, it turns out there's a name for this, a Buddhologist. He, okay, that's a good name. Yeah, right? I know. I, I would like to call myself one even though I have no reason to. Um, and, uh, you know, he had spent a long time in Tibet and, you know, read, uh, read the languages and stuff. And um, so I took like every class he offered. And um, but he was in the religion department and had nothing to do with philosophy in the sense that that we normally think of it um, in, in the English speaking world anyway. And. And then I was really interested in North African pre-Islamic history. I just developed this interest by reading on my own. But there was no one at the school who did that. So I basically was given like passes by various historians to study on my own this stuff. And um, so philosophy is not something I, I took or, or frankly had any interest in. Um, the one exposure I'd had to philosophy is I think at one time I had gone to a Barnes and Noble and looked at an Aristotle book and, um, and, uh, I don't even remember what the book was. And my feeling was, this is just word games. Uh, yeah, that was my initial feeling. I think a lot of people have that. Yeah. 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 Uh, whereas the Asian religious thought stuff, whatever, whether it was right or wrong or whatever, it at least felt like it was trying to get at something deep not how to put words together or something. Something, though, that you often say in class when people ask frustrating questions is you're not sure how this is anything more than a nonverbal question. Oh, or a yeah. Verbal, if right. it is just a verbal question. Right, that's right. And yeah. a lot of philosophy is just that, which sort of detracts from the good philosophy, <laughs> which hopefully we'll talk some about. Right, so I... I, I um. It's not that I've come to the view that all philosophy is is deep and and uh, not verbal. I do think there's a lot of verbal disagreement. I think sometimes even what become the most uh, prominent debates in in uh, in certain areas are are best understood as essentially verbal disagreements. But but I definitely don't think that's the whole story. And I think, you know, my reaction was a typical naive 17-year-old or 18-year-old reaction to, you know, hearing somebody uh, or reading somebody uh, make a philosophical claim, which is like, oh, that's just semantics or Mm -hmm. something, you know. So the main thing that I wanted to talk about was your book, your recent book, Mm -hmm. Morality and Mathematics. And I've mentioned to you that I worked on something somewhat similar or tried to work on something somewhat similar. So I guess this is my intro to how I got interested in philosophy. Cool, so yeah. when I was in high school, I was a very similar student to you. Oh. But I was in something called an IB program. Have you? Yeah, heard I've of heard of those. Yeah, I, I, I would have never got into that. But. Yeah, so <laughs> our junior and senior year, they put us in a course called Theory of Knowledge, wow. which we would call epistemology. That's cool. But it's really just... A pretty broad survey of philosophy so we start out like the first semester is logic and we do propositional yeah. logic hmm. maybe some predicate calculus mm-hmm. but then we also went over all the fallacies and the sort yeah, of stuff yeah. they don't teach in a logic course right today but after that there were various units in 
I think we did philosophy of art, philosophy of history, oh. philosophy of math, That's, philosophy wow. of science. That's kind of amazing. Yeah, it was. And so philosophy of math and philosophy of science were absolutely my favorite courses that I took. Interesting. In high, not just high school, but those are probably the best courses that wow. I've ever taken just because I was so unaware of those topics right. that when they struck me, they were very powerful. But... In particular, I was very fascinated by the idea of non-Euclidean geometry. Uh Because when you're a middle schooler and Mm -hmm. a high schooler, all you do is Euclidean geometry. And for all of our... I wouldn't know, but yeah, that sounds right. (laughs) For all of our lovely listeners, um, geometry, or Euclidean geometry, the Euclidean plane is where we do most of the typical geometry that people use in everyday life. And it was developed by Euclid a very long time ago. And I don't think he had a complete axiomatization. Well, of, it wasn't like rigorous by or right. today's standards. And, right? But Hilbert gave, Hilbert gave mm-hmm. a, yeah. a, a complete axiomatization. But the various axioms sort of provide the rules for the game of geometry. You could say it like that. The same way the rules of chess provide the Mm -hmm. rules for the game of chess. And one of them, I think it's Euclid's fifth axiom is equivalent to Playfair's postulate, Mm -hmm. which says that if you have uh, a straight line, we'll call it L, and then a point that's not on the line A, there's only one line that goes through A that's parallel to L. Mm-hmm. Right. And non-Euclidean geometries say, okay, let's take all the other rules of geometry and or of Euclidean geometry, except we'll change this one axiom. And I think it was Bolyai and Lobachevsky who discovered hyperbolic geometry, which is what happens when we change it so that the rule is there are an infinite amount of lines that go through L, or that go through the point A that are not parallel to L. Is that correct? An infinite number of lines that go through the point that never intersect the original line. Right, that never intersect the original line. And then the other one is elliptic geometry, which is there are an infinite amount of lines going through that point that are parallel to well, so the um, other the other case is, is um, any line is eventually going to intersect with the original right. line yeah. that goes through the point. And I found this very fascinating. And am I right that it was Einstein's gravitational lensing experiment or prediction that showed that hyperbolic geometry is the actual, or is more close, at least, to the actual geometry of physical space? Well, Einstein's, geomet- Einstein's gravi- the gravitational lensing predicted by general relativity shows that the, the um, geometry of space-time, and that's essential because the geometry of space um, it, it, uh, itself uh, already Riemann thought that maybe uh, it was curved and Gauss thought it was curved, but the curvature was undetectable um, at the time. But, but when, you take in, when you think about space-time rather than space, um, you know, the curvature is significant. And it's not that, it's not that the geometry, anybody thinks that the geometry of the universe is um, hyperbolic or, um, or elliptic or Euclidean. They think it's uh, variably curved Riemannian manifold. Um, and so, so what that means is that you vary the curvature from point to point. Now, at every point in, in the space-time, uh, it approximates what's called Minkowski space-time, which is the space-time that the mathematician Minkowski realized is, is the appropriate uh, arena for special relativity. Um, and, uh, and that is a flat space-time, but it's not Euclidean uh, space-time. Okay. Yeah. But, so the way that, for me, this connected to ethics in my very immature philosophical thought 
at the time was you change one rule yeah. in the axi- axiomatization of geometry and you get a, a radically different space. Mm-hmm. And yet everybody thought that the space in which we live was Euclidean. I mean, that's, that's, I think, was the Greek basis for Euclidean geometry, was they thought that they were modeling physical space. And what occurred to me was, I think I was, I don't know why I would have been reading this at this age, because I'm still not prepared for it, but I was reading something by Chomsky. Mm -hmm. And what I found was he was arguing very convincingly for his, I think his political position, mm-hmm. which is like yeah. syndico and anar- something yeah, that, yeah. I, that I, I don't recall the name of, but I totally disagreed with where he ended up, hmm. but it didn't seem like there was any flaw in his reasoning. And hmm. what, it, what, it, what occurred to me after having studied the non-Euclidean geometries was, oh, he just started out mm-hmm. with very different assumptions yeah. than I did. And so I thought, okay, there is a very close parallel, pun intended. Uh-huh. Well, no pun intended, but now there's pun <laughs> intended, between axiomatic mathematics and ethics, in a sense. In, again, this very immature sense that a lot of people, or people end up with drastically different ways of viewing the world. And it all stems from very different assumptions about what the moral laws might be, Mm -hmm. something corresponding to axioms. So on the one hand, you might have somebody who believes in the Ten Commandments, and the, the word of God then is, it forms the basis for the moral framework in which they see the world. Right. Or you have uh, somebody of a different religion or an atheist or somebody who's just never encountered these rules and lives in a different culture. But because of that, I, I in college, thought I would write this thesis yeah. that I titled Mathematics and Morality. Oh, wow. And, wow. <laughs> and of course, I had never taken a meta-ethics class uh-huh. I had never taken a philosophy of mathematics class, and so the committee at my school turned it down and didn't let me write it, which is probably a good idea because I didn't know what I was talking about. But only afterwards did I even realize that there was a discipline called metaethics mm-hmm. that was grappling with some of the same questions that I had happened right. upon, right. and then I came to Columbia and lo and behold, a professor <laughs> has just published a groundbreaking book called Morality in Mathematics. So I think starting at ground one, I was going to say ground zero, but <laughs> I guess we don't say that anymore. <laughs> starting at point one, what is metaethics? Yeah, um, I mean, so like the textbook answer is that, that metaethics is the... The theory, the the metaphysical, epistemological, and semantic theory of ethics. So rather than proposing what's right or wrong, it's trying to ask the question, what are we even doing when we ask what's right or wrong? Are there ethical facts out there waiting to be discovered that we're trying to detect? Um, If there are, how in the world would would we know those? If we're not doing that, what else are we doing with things that sure look like declarative sentences? Um, If they're if they're uh, if they're not expressing propositions about the world, how is it that logic applies? You know, you can be criticized for contradicting yourself in ethics, just as you can in in math. So that's that's the scope of metaethics, and it, as far as I I know, I mean. It only came into its own as a sort of, uh, you know, clarified discipline um, with the professionalization of philosophy and especially uh, with the um, publication of Moore's Principia Ethica, 
which is seen as one of the sort of founding documents in meta ethics, even though there's also a lot of ethics in that book. Okay. And so a typical ethical question right. that everybody, most people probably know is like the, tr- the trolley problem. Right. Yeah. Good. And yeah. so I, I heard people talking about the trolley problem recently mm-hmm. and the way they described it was there is, I'd say there, there are some children on some train tracks or trolley tracks or in the trolley line. I guess a trolley is not on tracks or maybe it is, but anyway, and then there's a man with a very big backpack standing <laughs> in front of, I the, haven't heard the backpack here yet. standing in front of the trolley. And for people who don't know, it's typical, or it was at least originally maybe stated with a very fat man right. standing in front of the trolley. And it, it was just interesting how, political correctness not that it's a problem to change it to a man with a very large backpack but how that's infiltrated even the philosophers <laughs> thought experiments yeah i had not heard this but so the question is so you have this man with the big backpack mm-hmm. standing in front of the trolley is it right to push him in front of the trolley because he is so large with his backpack that he'll stop the trolley and save the few children's lives mm-hmm. uh, and it the ethical question is, should you do this? Should you not do this? Mm-hmm. And what is the meta-ethical... Qu- is there a meta-ethical question in there? Well, well, sure. It's just not specific to that, that case. So the, the, the meta-ethical questions would be, is that a factual question? In the same sense as, like, you know, are there gravitons? So, like, is there a right answer? Yeah. It, to... Well, well <clears throat> right. I mean, of course, you know, that's slippery, too. But... but I mean, the best way I think to get a grip initially on what I mean by factual question is is to to compare it to other kinds of questions that everyone feels like they have a grip on, like you know whether there are gravitons gra- might not be the best example. Well, then. <laughs> well, I take it. Okay, so is there life outside our solar system? Um, is, so is water made of H two O? So yeah. with the solar system question, you're already bringing in the possibility of there being yes or no questions that we don't know the answer to. Correct. I, I take that to be beyond serious. Right. Okay. Uh, I no. usually like to think, like, is the sky blue or something like that? Or is this wall white something? Yeah, believe it or not. I mean, those are tricky cases because, of course, color yeah. is a tricky case. But Okay, that's, but, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, but, but no, I mean, what's the point of inquiry? It's to acquire new information. It's to ask a question that I don't know the answer to. So there, So there better be... There better be things I don't know. I mean, it would be um, uh, th- the most wild kind of uh, uh, solipsism to think that somehow the world comes into being as I form beliefs or something. Mm-hmm. So anyway, yeah, choose your favorite example, though. I mean, you know, like, uh, did, did Joe commit the burglary or something? I mean, it doesn't have to be speculative, theoretical questions. And so one metaethical issue is, <clears throat> is the trolley question like that? Is there an answer waiting to be discovered? Maybe we won't discover it, but, you know, there is an answer. Um, another question is, if there is an answer, how would we know it? In the case of, yes. like, if Joe committed the burglary, you know, you look for fingerprints and so on and so forth. In the case of gravitons, you look for, uh, you know, uh, data outside a particle accelerator, I guess. Um, So that's the epistemological question. Yeah, that's the epistemological question. But the semantic question um, uh, would then be, when we ask that question, are we even asking a question of fact at all? So, um, you know, another possibility is that when someone says that you ought to, you know, uh, push the guy with the backpack, kill the one to save the five or whatever, um, that's actually something just like uh, imperative that can't be true or false. Um, it's 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 the the better way to think about it. The more perspicuous way to put it would just be push the push the guy with the backpack. So that can't be true or false, but it reflects somehow my emotional disposition. I would like others to conform to it. Uh, it's more like rooting for a football team at a game. You're, you're expressing some kind of approval or disapproval. Um, you know, you're, you're even trying to get the world to be a certain way, but no one would think that boo or yay can be true or false or our descriptions of how the world is. So, so those are three questions, but 
you know, they multiply, but those are three meta ethical questions that you'll notice aren't specific to that question. They're just, they're questions about generic moral questions. You could ask them about, you know, whether the death penalty is permissible. Right. So it's case <clears throat> in specific. Yeah. In and and this is, this is one of the features of meta ethics, which is you don't turn to the meta ethicist to figure out what to do. You turn to the meta ethicist to figure out what in the world I'm asking when I ask that question. Would, would be the slogan sort of difference between the ethicist and the methods. So when I think of the trolley problem case, yeah, I think uh, the meta-ethical meta question that comes to mind is, is the question, uh, or what is, is this right or wrong relative to? I'm wondering where, how you look at the question of what are the axioms for ethics? Or are there right. axioms for ethics? Is there some corollary? Right, so, I mean, one, one issue that, you know, you gotta get out of the way immediately is that um, in the case of mathematics, there sure seem to be two kinds of axiom. And so you'll notice there's no debates over the parallel postulate or, or Euclidean versus non-Euclidean geometry. What do you mean there are no debates over it? People just accept that they are distinct yeah. systems yeah. and we can do good work in either one of them. Exactly. So, so of course there's questions about physical geometry, about the actual geometry of space-time, um, even though it's settled that it's not Euclidean. Um, but, um, but and, and that is something that physicists, physicists exactly. would be researching. Uh, yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. Not mathematics. You wouldn't be doing it right. with pen and pencil and paper only. You would mm -hmm. have to get some data, like, right. for example, um, you know, uh, the data that uh, was from, from Einstein's gravitational. Lens exactly. Thing. Right. Something yeah. Like um, so, so one thing to say is um, there are certain sets of axioms in certain areas of math that 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 it's it, no one has ever. Um, uh, since since um the dawn of analytic philosophy um i mean it's always a risky to say no one i'm sure someone but virtually no one has thought there's a serious question so so um i think actually frega <laughs> frega is a tricky case but anyway um you know so so the standard view about geometry is the one you just described it's like there's hyperbolic structures they use euclidean structures it's elliptic structures <clears throat> and then, of course, there's just the general subject of differential geometry. Um, uh, um, similarly, with abstract algebra, no one would, you know, no one would debate the axiom of commutativity or something. There's just it just talks about its class of models. And I think you're going to get into set theory in a moment, but it's a very worthwhile philosophical question, I think, to ask yeah. why there is no dispute about these axioms. Right. So, so. Um, I agree with you. And here's, um, he, well, let me, let me try my, my guess is that it's because they all sort of exist in a sense in set theory already. Yeah. I think that's part of the answer, but that kind of delays the question. Why take a different attitude towards set theory? I mean, they could mm -hmm. all exist in set theory, but you could still be some kind of like, there's lots of different set theories person. So, maybe maybe you should say briefly what set theory is. At this so point. set set theory is is um, literally the theory of sets, which is roughly speaking collections of things. I say roughly speaking because um, the notion of set that has become canonical, what's called the iterative notion of set, is is certainly not what's ordinarily meant by like a team uh you know the chicago cubs are, mm -hmm. are are not a set in the literal sense that gets applied in set theory but it's something like collection and it, it, uh, you know uh, uh, there's been a lot of bold claims made for the role of set theory but one thing that is pretty uncontroversial is um you can interpret all of mathematics um as claims about sets in disguise. So what that means is that the only non-logical idea in the ultimate, in the, in the sentence that you get after the translation is, is a member of. Mm -hmm. So that, that translation fact is an interesting and striking fact. In other words, Quine distinguished 
uh, reduction in what he called ideology um, versus reduction in, in kind of like epistemic reduction, reducing things epistemically to some, some more basic the uh, axioms or principles. You don't have to set, accept the second thing, that set theory somehow is the epistemological foundation for mathematics to accept the, f the first thing. But more, more to give a more colloquial summary of, yeah, what, sure. of what you said, yeah. when you say that set theory serves as the interpretation of mathematics, we sort of think about sets, these collections of things, as the objects about which statements of mathematics ultimately are referring to or governing. Well, so that actually, I, I, I didn't want to build into that. You that's didn't. that's okay. one of the things you could say. Yeah, so, so one of the things, so there's a general term that gets thrown around and it's one of those terms that it's like, you know, I always tell my students never use the word objective in a paper unless you explicitly define it. So it's a stipulative use yeah. of the word. In a similar way, I think no one should ever ask unless they're going to stipulatively define whether set theory is a foundation for math. You know, um, foundation can just mean so many different things. One of the things it can mean is indeed what you just suggested, which is that all math is actually about sets. And, you know, mm -hmm. you'd never know it, but it, that turns out that strikes me as an extremely implausible claim. I mean, that's a, basically a claim of empirical natural language semantics um, about how mathematicians use words. And I mean, I think you'd be very hard pressed to make that case. Um, uh, a, a claim in the neighborhood that that's at least not about natural language semantics is that all we should believe in is the iterative hierarchy that is basically sets the, the intended model of set theory um uh but um but the claim that i was making was just there is an interpretation of mathematical statements okay. in set theory and it there might also exist or be interpretations elsewhere exactly like okay. you know um categories or 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 type uh, you know yeah, yeah. homotopy type theory yeah um yeah. and so again to just add another gloss to this when we're talking about the axioms of geometry, we're saying that those structures are interpretable as set theoretic structures. That's right. They can, all those different geometries can live in a single set theory. That's true. And that's where we're saying the questions about why we will accept the various geometries just point back to the question of the set theoretic axioms. Well, so, so I thought you were suggesting that the reason we take a different attitude towards set theory and geometry is all the different geometries can live in a single set theory, yes. but not conversely. Um, like you can't have all, you know. Model set theory on. On like Euclidean, in Euclidean space or something. That is roughly what I was saying. Okay. Um, so, so I. I you know, I do think that kind of pushes the um, lump in the rug a little bit down uh, down the rug. I've never heard. I, this I always miss phrase. this mess this one up. Lump in the carpet. Anyway, um, uh, but uh, closer just, to the center of the carpet that would make it harder to get out. Okay, yeah, let's make it the okay. So, so, um, so the issue is, um, so there's this there's this fact that you can interpret all these different you know theories in mathematics and in uh, in the language of set theory and and prove and, and you can it given the interpretation they can become theorems in set theory with the right axioms if you assume let's say zfc set theory but th the question you started with i think or we're getting at is so why why do we not take the attitude towards ZFC set theory that we take towards, say, Euclidean geometry? It's just like one, one of different sets. You could have ZF plus the axiom of determinacy, which is kind of like the negation of the parallel postulate. Um, you know, you, you could have the anti-foundation anti axiom, an anti-foundation axiom, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, any non-redundant axiom will be independent, of, logically independent of the other, so you can always flip it and you won't get a consistency, inconsistency. Um, so why is it not like that? Well, that's a good question. And here's what I think is part of the answer. 
part of the answer is that unlike geometry, um, uh, set theory interprets arithmetic. Arithmetic, meanwhile, is um, is what lets you talk about syntactic facts. It's 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 tantamount by by good old coding to to facts about provability, consistency, what are what are known as meta theoretic facts. Um, so so take a claim to be very concrete, like. Um, like, uh, so suppose we, we think that, you know, is there an objective fact about um, the ZFC axioms? Well, here's a claim about the ZFC axioms. You can't derive a contradiction from, from them. Now that claim seems like it's either true or false. That claim turns out to be equivalent to an arithmetic claim that's mm -hmm. written con ZFC. Um, so it seems like we at least want to think that claims that amount to syntactic claims or meta theoretic claims. You can keep going. I'm just readjusting. Oh, sure. Um, are not the kinds of things where it's just to each his own. Like, it doesn't seem like, okay, so, um, you know, well, you can drive a contradiction in, in this theory. Uh, oh, sorry, I should say, according to this meta theory. You can't according to this one. And that's all there is to it. Like, suppose I'm checking. The theory for for you know a code of, like for, for zero equals one a proof of zero equals one i mean there should be a fact of the matter as to whether or not i'll, I'll ever get it and so that that says that at least some part of zfc namely the the, the kind of arithmetic claims of zfc are not like geometry so that doesn't yet say that there's a fact about something like the axiom of choice that's not like the parallel postulate. But you might say to yourself, look, once I have stuck my neck out and I'm claiming there are some facts which are not just theory relative, like facts that amount to syntactic facts about provability or whatever, mm -hmm. why would I stop? Why would I draw the line there? I mean, isn't, shouldn't, I, shouldn't I also compare, you know, axioms uh like you know whatever we set as a choice function uh versus alternatives to that shouldn't i also look at those for their plausibility and um and ultimately arrive hopefully at some single arena where i can interpret all of math and it will be the final arbiter and the final core that would be the dream that that is the dream of some people that's yeah. the that's the dream of you know somebody like Hugh wooden or penelope maddie right um, Heim Gaifman, another professor at Columbia, has told me that he would prefer it if the twin primes conjecture were independent. So that's, f for our audience, that's the statement that there are uh, infinitely many... The, the twin prime conjecture is the statement that there are infinitely many primes of the form n plus 2. n plus 2, yeah, that are prime. And if that were independent, that would mean infinitely many primes n such that n plus two is also prime. Yeah, yep. yeah. And if it were independent, then that would mean that there are questions, seemingly questions that should have an answer about math that we can't prove, and we can't prove that. Well, we can't prove a, an affirmative or a negative answer. I assume what he means is independent in piano arithmetic. So right. you can't prove if piano arithmetic is consistent, either an affirmative answer or a negative answer. Right. Um, of course, we already know that by the what I was just saying, but, but I think what he's saying is it would be really deep and fascinating if there were kind of a natural mathematical question with Correct. that feature. Right. Something so, different from, uh, from what Girdle... Yeah, did. exactly. Right. Right. And of course... You know, there are cases that people came up with, like Goodstein's theorem and stuff. But 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 something as elementary as that 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 is an open question that mathematicians are actively trying to resolve. Number theorists are trying to resolve. That would be a shocking development. Um, and and uh, it seems extremely unlikely. <laughs> right. But it's a good question. Why? I mean, it's you know, it's a good question. The, you know, it's, it's striking that number theorists never worry about this. They never worry about the independence phenomenon. And, uh, and one view on that is they're being irresponsible, but another view is, but they've been right. 
for a hundred years when basically when i mean they, 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 nobody has given a convincing case of something where the number theorists worked on it and then somebody proved that you know for a long time and then and then it was proved independent um i mean there are some delicate cases and harvey friedman has been trying to make more and more persuasive cases of ordinary mathematical statements that are that are independent but but basically that's the narrative you get from number theorists and that's why something like the showing the twin primes conjectures independent would really be a remarkable development um it, because it would just show that whole attitude has to be uh, given up so i'd like to return mm -hmm. to a bit more to the meta ethics side sure yeah now that we've talked a little bit about set theory and how there are debates about the different right. set theories and i'm wondering where in in let's say the trolley example whether yeah. whether there is a right answer or there isn't a right answer right where we find the wiggle room for there to be different answers where maybe it's right for one group of people or not right for another group of people or if that way of looking at it even makes sense of well pushing this guy in front of the trolley right so i mean so I mean, you got to distinguish truth from belief in any area, whether or not you end up thinking that there isn't a truth independent of belief. The ideas are different. And so if there's a truth about this, it's not relative to anything. There's going to be some theory that describes the truth. Um, but it's not like, um, uh, I, sorry, I should say if there's an objective truth, if it's not just a, a radically relativistic kind of truth. Um, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was just going. I was going to bring that back to the geometry, but I exactly. Can't. No, but that's right. If it's not like geometry, yeah. Um, but but um, suppose it were like geometry. What would it? What would be the analog to the parallel postulate? And in this case, you know, the, the you know the the simplest framework that you could relativize on is you know utilitarianism or a consequentialist theory versus what's called a deontological theory. Um, these you know. These views are associated uh, respectively with like Bentham and Mill in the first case and Kant in the second case. Bentham? Yeah. Uh, Bentham. Uh, I just think of Van Bentham, the electrician. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. Um, so Bentham was a remarkable figure way ahead of his time who, who advocated um, uh, the view according to which basically something's good if it, if it maximizes happiness generally where happiness he had a particular understanding of but he also had very on the basis of this view he had very um you know radically progressive views about for example like prison reform and stuff way before you could in, you know with a straight face say something like this in public and um but anyway so the key point is if you're a, a consequentialist or a utilitarian then you think that whether this thing is right or wrong depends on the consequences. Right. And the consequences are better if you push the guy. Yes. Um, Not for his mother. That's correct. But the overall consequences, that's the crucial thing. Yes. So the crucial thing is that so, some people think like, when the first time they hear about utilitarianism or something, they think that sounds very selfish. No, 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 you've misunderstood. That's subjectivism. Utilitarianism looks at the happiness of all of humanity. Maybe not even humanity. Maybe it includes like animals too. Yeah. The happiness, across the universe. Yeah, yeah, across the universe of any agent capable of that experience. And the way though that this reminds me of the geometry case is, so this utilitarian view sort of, presupposes maybe not with rigorous axioms but some space uh, in which the actor lives or the uh, us talking about it the way the space is in that uh, ethical space if you will that certain uh, entities are happy and there is maybe like a, an amount of like a pleasure gauge on the universe and if one ac one action might lower the pleasure gauge, one might uh, raise the pr the pleasure gauge. Whereas the other view you were talking about, the non utilitarian, mm -hmm. uh, non consequentialist view, mm -hmm. they would have a another radically different way of looking at the world, where this pleasure gauge doesn't even fit into it at all. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't matter ethically. 
uh, for the for the deontologist. Um, so right. So the, so so if the question is. Um, will this maximize, let's use the word utility, because the specific term happiness has all these connotations and, and any utilitarian will technically define what they mean <clears throat> and they better do it in a non-ethical way. Um, so it's not circular. Um, so they'll say it'll maximize utility to push the guy with the backpack. The deontologist will say, well, there's a, there's a red line, uh, a, a rule of, of ethics that says you can never use a person as a means. Uh, and you would be doing exactly that to push the person uh, on the tracks. You'd just be using them as a means and not respecting their autonomy to use the lingo. So those are two different frameworks to look at all of ethics and they're going to give different answers. That right. of course does not answer the question of whether or not uh, there is a fact of the matter in the sense that we were talking that there might be a fact of the matter about like whether arithmetic is consistent. Right, where it's not just each his own. It depends on what you know the background theory uh, you're relativizing on is, because you know you Wait, can you're always. You're saying they're different. Um, I'm I'm saying that I'm saying that the fact that you get different answers um, by conditionalizing on different theories, of course, does not show that there's only relative answers. Okay. You could say the same thing about set theory or arithmetic, right? So um, you know, like. Piano arithmetic plus the negation of the claim that it's consistent, the claim that there, it codes a proof of zero equals one, of course, implies that there is a proof of zero equals one. So in the case of the the utilitarians and the consequentialists, yeah. the consequentialists that there is a right answer for each one suggests that there are, there are at least relative answers. Correct. Well, well, relative. I, it, I mean, it depends on what you mean by relative answers. Relative answers, in a sense, are totally cheap, and there's no one who would deny that about any subject at all. I mean, take any claim. You can come up with another claim from which it follows, and then you could call the first claim uh, uh, the answer to the question you relative started with relative to, to the premises. So, okay. so I mean, that's a cheap and uninteresting sense of relative, but but it's a verbal sense of relative. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, Robinson, it's just a verbal point. Um, yeah. No, uh, yeah, um, no, but but right. So so what, I mean, there's another issue that that we haven't gotten into, but um, which is how to even formulate an interesting kind of relativism, right? Because um, because you don't want you don't want relativism to just amount to the banality that I mentioned. Can we leave math behind for mm -hmm. a moment and yeah. talk about how? there can be an interesting sort of relativism around like this trolley problem we just discussed. Sure. And yeah. The consequentialist and the deontologist. Sure. So, um, so, so one way, um, one way there can be an interesting kind of relativism is if, uh, if what you, what you vary, the framework you vary, is not the asserter's framework, but the evaluator's framework. So there's something called assessor relativism. And what that means is that um, though you don't say the words relative to utilitarianism, so you know this is wrong, um, when you say something like this is wrong, that is, um, that is right th that is true or false the utterance depending on me the assessor's background uh moral framework that i happen to adopt i see okay um so i mean so that's one kind of relativism another kind of relativism that's interesting comes out of the constructivist tradition and specifically the humean constructivist uh position where roughly speaking what's right or wrong is a function out of my mouth is a function of what um would would maximize uh uh well i guess the best way to put it is what um what what coheres with with my own sense of, of um, my own moral sentiments, if they were maximally coherent, if they were maximally, like if all the inconsistencies were worked out, if, um, 
if uh, if it was made sort of maximally explanatory and systematic, what would follow from that? And on that view, you'll have relativism insofar as, as you put it at the beginning of this discussion, our starting points are very different. But the starting points here are not theories, they're like sentiments. They're like um, kind of like matters of taste. So you can think of like constructivism and aesthetics as being like the, the idea that, you know, what's beautiful or not out of my mouth is a function of, you know, given full non-aesthetic information and, um, and uh, you know, perfect cognitive faculties so that I never like, uh, I'm real good with logic. Um, this would follow from my aesthetic preferences that it's beautiful. Um, there's an analogous view in the Humean ethical tradition, and that implies relativism insofar as our basic kind of moral sentiments vary from person to person. But Hume thought, and many people think we actually share a lot of basic moral sentiments, so a lot of moral disagreement is real because it's basically confusion. It's basically we're making logical mistakes or we didn't get all the empirical information right or something like that. And some people have gone so far as to claim, these are not Humeans, but some people, famously Derek Parfit, went so far as to claim that all ethical disagreement is actually just kind of ignorance of, of empirical facts, um, uh, logical mistakes, or the influence of you know, like religious dogma or personal investment and something Parfit points out is that, you know, secular ethics in the way that we have secular math, you know, there's no church telling you you're not allowed to prove a certain theorem is a, is a recent phenomenon. And so we should not expect that ethics would look like math um, when it's only really been around in the, in the sense that the sciences have um, for what, a hundred years? Um, so, so anyway, so that's how you can get different sorts of relativism. Um, how much the, how wild the relativism is, is how much disagreement will end up being verbal mm -hmm. depends on how similar you think we are as people and our basic sentiments are. Something that we haven't gotten into yet that is uh, crucial to your book is the question of realism. Right. And could you quickly say a bit about what realism is, since I know that you've done a lot of thought about this? Yeah, well, I mean, so first of all, I don't think this is like a pie in the sky. I don't think there's a pie in the sky answer. I think, you know, realism is a technical term that philosophers okay. have invoked. And, um, you know, it comes up in different areas. So there's, you know, scientific realism versus anti-realism and so on. But there is, um, you can impose some order on the debates. Um, basically, uh, realism about an area, whether it be ethics or, or, or math or empirical science or aesthetics or matters of taste, you can I mean, consider any area you like philosophy generally, um, is, is the view that there are, when, when we make statements from the area, we're saying things that can be true or false and try to reflect the way the world is. Um, and uh, whether, whether what we say is true or false is not up to us. It's up to the world, broadly construed. By the world, I don't mean you know, the totality of rocks and electromagnetic fields and so on. I mean the, the totality of facts, so to speak. Uh, um, so um, so it, it, it's very much like the view that we started with when we asked things like, are there gravitons or life outside the solar system or did Joe commit the burglary? And so part of what it means to be a realist about something is presumably that the things we are discussing or, or statements about the things we are discussing are true independent of us. Right. The independent is tricky because that is tricky. Okay. It's tricky simply because it should make sense to be a realist about like mental entities, for instance, which wouldn't make sense if there were none because there aren't people. Exactly. So the kind okay. of independence that's at issue is not like you don't want it to be the case that like 
Joe, Joe is wrong to lie is true even if Joe doesn't exist, right? Mm -hmm. you, want, you, want it, what, you want it to be the case that whether Joe is wrong to lie doesn't depend on whether anybody else believes it's wrong. Okay. So, so sure, of course, whether Joe is wrong to lie depends on people in some sense. There's mm -hmm. got to be Joe. But whether that's true doesn't depend on whether I think so. I could be wrong. So it's it's um, it's what the, the the term that's used in the literature. Uh, I think Russ Schaefer Landau is the one who introduced the term. But I mean, it's 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 the general idea that pervades all realist literature is stance independence. The 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 fact is independent of anybody's stance on it. Not, of course, independent of whether they're human beings or something. Okay, and so we have before us the two areas. We have ethics, mm -hmm. and we have mathematics mm -hmm. and so what is an example of a a simple mathematical fact that one might be a realist or an anti-realist about well i already mentioned one uh take arithmetic statements that um are tantamount to statements about like consistency um you know it's it's a very tempting view to say something like any consistent set of axioms is as good as any other. It's just a matter of um, convenience or interest, which ones you use. But the problem is that um, it's consistent to say false things about consistency. If like piano arithmetic is consistent, uh, that's good old second incompleteness theorem. So, so, so if we say that and stick to it, what we'll end up saying is that um, uh, theories that disagree about what's consistent are equally okay. But then it's unclear like what my view even comes to. Any consistent theory is as good as any other depends on which, you know, from what perspective I'm taking. Mm -hmm. Like, I, am I taking one according to which arithmetic is consistent or according to which it's not? Both those are consistent if arithmetic is consistent. So, right. so you know, considerations like these lead one to say, it sure seems like there should be a fact as to whether or not arithmetic is consistent, but that's an arithmetic claim. Mm -hmm. And it's also a claim that you can't prove or refute in arithmetic if it's consistent. So that's a fairly strong kind of independence because it's not just a claim that nobody has proved. You can prove that you can't prove it or refute it if arithmetic is consistent. So that would be a kind of claim where you might want to be a realist. Um, but, uh, but, you know, we already mentioned the axiom of choice. Every set has a choice function, um, is a, is a, a standard axiom of mathematics, but it's an axiom that a lot of people, uh, disagreed about at the turn of the 20th century and, and the sense in which consensus was, um, obtained, you might argue, is more sociological than uh, theoretical. I mean, there are still people who advocate, uh, you know, vigorously uh, against the axiom of choice, and it's not like they're waiting on outstanding conjecture. So there's a philosophical debate in the background. As a matter of sociology, the mathematics community has moved on and used the axiom of choice. Um, one view would be that um, set theories with it and with its negation are, um, are there's no independent fact waiting to be discovered whether one of those is right and the other is wrong. It's, it's kind of a matter of mathematical taste. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, so that would, be, that would be a view where you're a realist about arithmetic, um, but you're not a realist about characteristic claims of set theory. Um, but of course, this is all, I mean, where you draw the line, if you draw it at all, is, is these are all controversial issues. So, I mean, there are people who aren't realists about arithmetic. There are people who are realists about the axiom of choice and much, you know, everything in the language of set theory, so. Yeah, there probably aren't that many people who aren't realists about arithmetic, though. There's not that many. That's, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting fact, but, but it, it's tricky because, um, you know, I think, you asked um, at some point in the th in uh, your list of questions. You asked, um, "What's fictionalism?" Yes. Any fictionalist is not a, a realist about arithmetic. Yeah. So could you? I think fictionalism is a very interesting yeah. position. And was Hartree Field, who 
in, invented. I don't know. Do you say when somebody comes up with a new theory or yeah, idea that they invent? Well, Hartree Field is the, the father of fictionalism. Was he your advisor? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's my advisor. So can you say a bit about what fictionalism is? Sure. So, so Hartree was, of course, focused on, on mathematical fictionalism. And that's just the view that any existentially quantified or atomic mathematical sentence is literally yeah. false. And, and that means a sentence of the form, uh, there is some number such that, well, the number object. part, yeah. But an assertion, there is, so with regard to... Or one that implies that, because an atomic sentence would imply that, yeah. Right, something like there are an infinite number of pairs of primes and exactly. n plus two. Yeah, or... A, a, and you're a, saying that those are strictly false. Yeah, or take a claim that's actually been proved, like there are infinitely many prime numbers, According to fictionalism, that is literally speaking, it's a false statement because there are no such things anywhere. Exactly. So the so it's a, so we would say that it's an anti-realist position. It's an anti-realist position on my taxonomy. I mean, you can draw, you can distinguish different different yeah. Uh, ways of, but yeah, on my most tax, people would call it. That, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it, so so there's two main components to the view. Just to clarify, though, one is a component about the world. And the component about the world is a claim that there are no things like numbers. There's, you know, there's a world we describe with numbers, but the numbers are not part of the world. Mm -hmm. The other part of the claim, though, is that when we say something like there are infinitely many prime numbers, we're saying things about numbers. Going back to the first part for a moment. Yes. So we would say physics uses yes. numbers and mathematical objects to describe the world. Right. But the, the theories of physics don't actually imply that there are mathematical objects in the world. No, well, that's the tricky part. The theories do imply that on a face value reading. On so, like Quine's view. Well, on any view, if you were to just write out a theory in a remotely, um, you know, logically careful way, almost any physical theory, it will straightforwardly imply the existence of mathematical entities, like a metric tensor in the case of relativity, or um, a Lagrangian in, in, in the case of, uh, you know, the standard model or whatever. So, um, so, so that's uncontroversial. What's, what the fictionalist says is those theories should be regarded as shorthand for better theories that one could in principle write down that don't imply the existence of mathematical objects. Um, and of course, a big part of fictionalism is thus to actually show that, that that's possible, that you can do that. And and Field Famous, you know, very creatively came up with some ways to do that in 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 a very specific arena, the 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 arena of a uh, you know, this is technical language kind of, but substantivalist interpretation of Newtonian space-time. So, so what that means is that space-time is a real thing. He takes that there as... There are points and those are real objects. Those are real objects. Uh, um, and, um, and you can interpret mathematical statements using them? Well, you can't... It's not that simple, actually. Okay. So, yeah, I ha it's funny. Yeah. That's the, the revi book, That's the, the, the new edition, right yeah. I haven't read it. I know that it's pretty much required reading but. yeah it's 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 a it's a great book and i yeah I, i've heard that he wrote it very quickly <laughs> which is kind of amazing but um but uh but yeah so 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 no he, it's 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 deeper than that it's not just like trying to find an interpretation of math it, it, it you know um reinterpreted as claims about space time or something um he has to come up with um analogs uh, surrogate analogs to you know the integral and the derivative that don't talk about mathematical entities and stuff it's a tricky thing and I mean if anyone is doubtful that it's tricky um, here's a reason to think so um, so it's reasonably clear how to generalize this to curved space spaces and in fact um, Frank Arzenius and Key and Dorr give one way of doing doing it for uh, Riemannian space, you know, variably curved space of general relativity. But, um, but nobody, in my view, I mean, this is a bit of a contentious claim, nobody in my view has made any real progress in the case of quantum theory. So Mark Bolliger came up with an officially fictionalist view of uh, um, quantum theory, but it uses something called uh, 
propensities or properties, which are sort of bad news in the same way. They're like abstract entities that you can't, you know, bump into and can't. Uh, so if you were worried about numbers and metric tensors and whatever, you should be worried about these things. Um, Eddie Chen ha has started to sketch um, a, a, a different approach, but but you know, for reasons I won't go into right here. First of all, it only deals with um, the uh, kinematics um, so far of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And secondly, in my view, it um, it's uh, you know it doesn't get off the ground with respect to the meta theoretic issues that we started with, which is that any anybody, whether you're a fictionalist or not, needs to be able to talk about consistency and what follows from their theory. They need to be able to say, for example, my theory implies that you'll see, uh, you know, uh, an electron pass through the... Um, mm -hmm. um, okay, so and, and they also need to say, you won't see such and such. It doesn't imply, say, you know, a contradiction. Um, but that's just arithmetic. So, so you can you can dress that up in different language. You can interpret it as claims about um, uh, you know physical objects if you postulate enough of them. But it's just as mysterious how we know those as we do claims about the numbers themselves, in my view. And and to be fair, Field is is was sensitive to this from the beginning. And what he did was help himself to primitive logical operators. But in my view, it's just as unclear how we could know these primitive logical facts as we could know the arithmetic facts. So it's, um, and it's, it's- Robbing Peter to pay Paul or something. Yeah, and, and I think it's, it's kind of understandable <clears throat> why one would think that a lot was accomplished by tr making this trade. It's, 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 it's actually the influence of Quine and the sort of fetish with ontology and thinking that all sorts of philosophical problems are depending on whether there are numbers or not or something. But I don't think any of that is where the action is. It's, it's at the level of kind of truth and truth independent of us. And it doesn't matter whether the theory is talking about some special object or not. If it's independent of us, how do we know it? And what, mm -hmm. role, and how, what role is it playing in the physical world? You can ask that whether or not you use a primitive consistency operator or take it to be about numbers. So I think you, you started <clears> off <throat> saying that there were two, two parts to the, to the fictionalist That's right. question. And That's I think right. we've only discussed the first oh, one. Oh, I'm sorry. So what was the second one? The second was the semantic part, which is, in my view, not like a super, you know, I don't think there's a lot going on here because it's what it sounds like. It's about how we actually use words. It's, it's the claim that when somebody says there are infinitely many prime numbers, they mean there are infinitely many prime numbers. Um, so that's why you get the conclusion that something like Euclid's theorem is literally false, because it literally it implies the existence of things which, um, you know, we're imagining don't exist. Uh, you could... You if could, we're anti-realists. If we're anti-realists. So... You could verbally disagree with fictionalism by saying the following. All I mean when I say that, say, 2 is prime is that according to the fiction of arithmetic, 2 is prime. And then you get the view that arithmetic is strictly true because it's all shorthand for these claims about the fiction. But, but the two views agree completely about the world, the non-semantic mm -hmm. world. They agree there are no numbers and so on. So <clears throat> a lot of the criticisms of fictionalism that I've heard. I'm curious if you think that they really stand up to any muster. Yep. And a lot of criticisms of fictionalism that I've heard don't talk so much about the mathematical side mm -hmm. as they talk about fiction. So mm -hmm. you might say that In a proof, if there's an error, then all of the mathematics falls apart. But if there's a typo in Harry Potter, nobody cares. Right. So, so fiction and mathematics are entirely disanalogous. Uh -huh. uh, and I imagine that you would say that somebody is misunderstanding the import of fictionalism if they think that's a serious problem. Well, so I've actually never heard that problem. That strikes me as not... A good objection okay. simply because almost every mathematics paper ever has typos has too typos, so yeah. and obviously math doesn't fall apart so in that mm -hmm. sense they seem very analogous actually 
Um, look, there's another criticism I can imagine, um, which is something like, in fiction, we say things um, in the spirit of make-believe. There's a specific attitude we take towards fiction. We suspend uh, disbelief. But mathematicians think of their of themselves as talking about things that are real and in some important sense. In some important sense. I mean, you know, on the weekdays they're Platonists, on the weekends they're formalists. It certainly seems like it's part of the practice to to say things in the you know with in the spirit of truth and falsity even if if on inspection that's not the best way to understand it so that's another problem with uh well maybe it's not well i think it's a it seems again at least on its surface like it's a problem for the fictionalist and that there is very widespread agreement about arithmetic uh, piano arithmetic its consistency but there is not widespread agreement in any analogous sense about Harry Potter. Like, what would that, what would that even mean, for there to be widespread agreement about Harry Potter that it's true or sure that is there widespread agreement that Sherlock Holmes lives at so and so address? I mean, it's written there, but there's a sense in which piano arithmetic could arrive at so many pe different people's minds uh, separately, but uh, is it Arthur Doyle? Arthur Conan Doyle? Something like that. Yeah. I mean, <coughs> Shakespeare, uh, not Shakespeare. Um, <laughs> why, Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes presented himself to Conan Doyle's mind and it's uh, highly improbable that uh, other people would come upon him. So right. why does it make sense to call how can we call mathematics fiction when it seems to speak to so many people as if it's coming from somewhere? Right. I mean, there's a bunch of different issues there. So, so the first one is about the semantics of fictionalism, which is it just doesn't seem like that's the spirit in which we say mathematical sentences. As I said, I think that's not like that big a deal. I mean, it, it, uh, uh, an obnoxious way to put it would be who cares what we mean? Like what, what's interesting is what there is and, and what the world is like. And uh, there's probably no determinate facts about our meanings. I mean, we're, we're, they're probably all over the place. Um, so, so that would, if that criticism were good, it would say that the fictionalist is wrong about the semantics of our language, but it wouldn't show that they were wrong about what there is. Maybe they're still right that there's no numbers. Uh, but, um, but uh, and sorry, the fictionalist we're imagining too is the fictionalist not of Hartree's kind, who explicitly agrees with you uh, that, that, that we say these things in different spirits, like to his prime in a different spirit from, you know, Sherlock Holmes smokes a pipe. Um, that's why he he says that the math is false because it tries to make a claim on the world and it's mm -hmm. not. Awesome. We're imagining a different kind of fictionalist now, where they think that to his prime is shorthand for, according to the fiction of arithmetic, to his prime. So it ends up being a lot like Sherlock Holmes smokes a pipe, and all. And what I'm saying at the moment is this criticism would at most show that well maybe Hartree's right, you know, about the about the semantics. So. There's another issue which you're bringing up, which is not specific to fictionalism. It's just kind of a general point about the merits of realism in math as opposed to anti-realism. Other, you know, there are other kinds of, of anti-realism, and um, and there's two two things I think you're saying. One is there's a lot of agreement in math. In, in fact, somebody might say there's unanimity, there's consensus in math. Mm -hmm. um, but of course there isn't in a lot of important ways, but we can, we right, can but not that's, talk about that for the moment. Yeah, but that's, that's going to be very, very subtle. And it's, and it's gonna, it, it's, it's, gonna, you know, it's not the kind of thing that gets a lot of press. Let's put it that way. The kinds of the sense in which there is disagreement. The second thing though, is maybe a more probing idea, which is that in some cases, though by no means anything like, um, all of mathematics, you have people who are apparently, you know, divorced historically, culturally, arriving at the same conclusions. Mm -hmm. And that does seem to be more like the empirical scientific case where you're just discovering things like, say, about cosmology 
um, there's a world that's kind of biting back and you're responding to it. It's constraining our views. There's, my ears are just getting sore. You're good. Uh, oh, okay. Um, it, th that, um, that, uh, that is an interesting fact, but, but you don't want to overstate it. I mean, the actual kind of cultural record, as far as I know, um, doesn't, I mean, doesn't even begin to give you anything like the math that we believe in today. It gives you like very rudimentary grade school arithmetic, period. And some, and some basic maybe Euclidean geometry. But, you know, even something like, um, uh, you know, even something like there are infinitely many prime numbers, um, you know, the, these kinds of claims, uh, I mean, arithmetic was not rigorously axiomatized until basically piano. And that was in the late 1800s? The late 1800s, yeah. right. So... So the idea, you know, some people say that, oh, we've been like implicitly working all along with the piano axioms. I mean, first of all, who's the we? Maybe, you know, Westerners from Europe or something. Maybe. Maybe. But that strikes me as already. A, I mean, a lot of people didn't have zero for a very long time. A lot of people didn't have zero. There's these studies that seem to show that, you know, people's intuitions in the West diverge from those of standard piano arithmetic. Um, uh, I'm not taking a stand on any of that. All I'm saying is that it's by no means obvious. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the second claim, if you could really make the case, that would be very interesting. Of course, there would be other ways to explain the convergence than, than um, by postulating independent facts about arithmetic, because after all, even if there were independent facts about arithmetic, um, the only way that would help explain agreement is if they had something to do with our coming to believe in the, those facts. But how would that work? Mm -hmm. Arithmetic facts, like there are infinitely many prime numbers, don't seem to be the same kind of thing as forces mass times acceleration. Right. They don't seem to have an effect on the world. Um, the role math plays in science does not seem to be the same as the role, or specifically mathematical postulates, you might say numbers, play in science does not seem to be the same as the role electrons play. So it's not even clear that the assumption that there is an objective fact independent of us I'm breaking my own rule and using objective here, but um, uh, about... It is a good rule, though. Yeah. I'm sure for undergraduates, particularly, who want to use the words objective and subjective, like every sentence. Yeah, exactly. Every sentence, right? Yeah. Um, it's not even clear that it would explain the convergence if there were any. But the second point is that it's hard... It, it, it's, it's by no means obvious that there is this kind of historical convergence beyond very rudimentary things that can actually be understood not as even claims about numbers, but just claims about our surroundings. So, but the third point was the kind of agreement we see today. So set aside this idea that, you know, when cultures were isolated, sometimes they seem to come up with the same views across cultural. So that's interesting, but there's also seems to be true in, in ethics too. So, so, okay. If that were pervasive and systematic, that would be striking. Um, but that's, that, that seems at best open. Now today though, you might say we're sharing information and everything and there's complete consensus on math, but this brings us to the, the thing you alluded to, and I won't foreshadow unless you want to get into it right now about disagreements over axioms and the status of that. I think that's a bit <clears throat> too heavy okay. for right now. Sure. Uh, but you did just touch on something else that I wanted to talk to you a bit about, which is indispensability arguments. Okay. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was Quine and Putnam who first popularized indispensability arguments. And it was a way sort of to vindicate their begrudging admittance of a realism about mathematical objects. Yeah, I mean, the, the, so the main idea is Quine's, and the idea is, can be seen in a begrudging spirit or a positive spirit. The positive spirit approach is that for a long time, people have been trying to explain how we could know math 
empirically, because we seem to understand empirical knowledge at least reasonably well. Of course, there's, you know, you can always worry your brain in a vat or something, but if you're not worried about that, there's an informative story to tell about how it is that we're reliable about those facts. It has to do with evolution, it has to do with psychophysics and photons hitting your retinas and stimulating your optic nerve and so on. Um, so, you know, like Mill, speaking of utilitarianism, uh, advocated the view that, that, that math is just a high level empirical science. Unfortunately, you know, the view, like, it's just loaded with problems. One of the problems is that it, it, it made math out to be an inductive science. And that just doesn't seem to explain its kind of certitude. You know, it's like, why, why would we have any confidence that every natural number has a successor? Just because so far, whenever we've collected things, we've found there's a bigger collection. I mean, that's an awful, awfully big extrapolation from mm -hmm. that. Um, but, but the second thing is, Mill doesn't even try to deal with mathematics as it was even understood in his time. I mean, he deals with rudimentary math and to, to generalize an inductivist view um, to math generally, I mean, the closest anyone's come to doing that is Philip Kitcher actually, and our very own Philip Kitcher. And that view relies on, um, on, on very explicitly the, the, the idea of extrapolation and, um, and, you might argue that it's really using math in the background to explain um, to explain where math comes from. So, um, so what Quine did, um, this is the positive spin rather than the begrudging spin, is to realize that there's a way of being an empiricist, thinking all knowledge is empirical, but also accounting for knowledge of mainstream mathematics like you know the intermediate value theorem and the standard things one learns beyond that you know two plus two is four and the way to do it is to realize that our i should i shouldn't say realize to to postulate that our our theories our empirical theories are confirmed or not wholesale so so the standard model of particle physics or something that to, the, the, that is confirmed as a, you know, as a package. And part of the package is a bunch of math. Mm -hmm. And part of the best systemization of the math that's used is going to be further math, all the way down ultimately to say the construction of the real numbers and, and, um, and other mathematical entities may be set theoretically. So ultimately he's saying you're getting justification even for set theory when you get a confirmation of a prediction of the standard model. So on this view, something like a met the metric tensor of, you know, um, special relativity or something, um, that is analogous to like, you know, gluons. It's a theoretical postulate whose justification is that it figures into the best explanation of our observations. So this positive spin on Quine's view is that it gives an empiricist epistemology for math that isn't obviously hopeless. Um, so it's an empiricist epistemology for math in that we know about mathematical objects or we have reason to be realist about them because we, in a sense, observe them. No, actually. I mean, it's, it's almost exactly the opposite of that. Well, we don't observe them, but they figure into our explanation for the things that we observe. Exactly. And so, it's the, uh, the explanation, that, because the explanation is indispensable, that those objects are indispensable in our ontology. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, here's a way to put it. So um, uh, he, th this, is, this is the begrudging way. The begrudging way to put it is Quine wanted to be a scientific realist. He wanted to believe in the approximate truth of our best theories. And of course, you know, our best theories are not literally true. They're going to be superseded. But here's what seems increasingly likely. The ultimate theory, whatever it is, even if humans never attain it, is going to use a lot of math. It just seems like it uses more and more math every time it gets, you know. Um, whether it's string theory or something that has nothing to do with string theory or, you know, some spin on loop quantum gravity or it doesn't matter. But whatever the ultimate theory, it's going to be a bunch of math. I want to be a scientific realist um, and believe that our best theories are 
converging on something true and ultimately the the best theory is going to use a bunch of math how can i do that with a straight face while saying i don't believe in math i mean suppose for the sake of argument that the standard model were the the full story um what could it mean to say i'm a scientific realist about the standard model but i'm an anti-realist about math and to his credit, Quine tried to actually say what it could mean. And this is similar to what Field is doing. It's just their approaches were different. Quine decided, it's, I'm never going to be able to say that. So I, I'm just, it's, it, as, a, as he called it, intellectual doublethink to say, on the one hand, I believe the standard model and I'm a realist about that. On the other hand, I'm an anti-realist about math. So he became, as you put it, a reluctant Platonist. That was his own word. Um, but uh, but you know Field's approach is is he he at least has more hope that you can ultimately give content to that even if we haven't done it yet. So I was actually going to bring this back to Field. So you yeah good. So I don't have to do that now. Yeah. But my next question is to bring us back again to metaethics. Yeah. And so have you taken or studied much philosophy of mind? I mean, not a not a ton. I, I I I have you know some views on details of the the dualist argument, but uh, particularly folk psychology at all. Um, a little bit. Yeah. So folk psychology for our our viewers. My mother. Yeah, for your mom. <laughs> Probably if, if she's made it this far. Folk psychology is a way of. It is the sort of common sense way that everybody interprets other people's behavior. It's our, our folk philosophy of mind. It's how we rationalize what other people are doing. So if, if Justin picks up his, his, it looks like a nice, I don't know if it's a Yeti, but it looks like it's it's keeping his water nice and cold. If he compass picks mortgage, his compass mortgage. <laughs> uh, that sounds almost like Yiddish, compass mortgage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, if he if he picks that up, I assume it's because there's something going on in Justin's mind. He's thirsty. Right. And so folk psychology is the way that everybody predicts other people's behavior uh, by explaining their behavior with mental states right and daniel dennett has a paper a famous paper called real patterns <laughs> right that i haven't read in many years do you know if you've read it i i have read it it's been a long time too yeah for me but i think that his his general argument it's about realism mm -hmm. and mental states so mm -hmm. it's somewhat tangential to what mm -hmm. we've been talking about and I apologize to Dan, who's definitely not listening to this, <laughs> if uh, he, if I totally butcher this, but my understanding is that he wants to uh, justify a belief, a realist belief about mental states in a somewhat similar way to how Quine wants to justify uh, a belief in mathematical objects. And this is all, I wasn't thinking, I've never thought about this really before five minutes ago. But so one example is, I think he gives this an example, is that you could have Martians with extremely sophisticated technology observing uh, my mother going down the street. And if they have no idea of what's going on in a human's mind and they only see us as collections of particles. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if she picks up a her compass mortgage mm -hmm. beverage container, she they have no way really of predicting what it is that she's going to do because they have no idea that humans have mental states. Whereas somebody who believes in mental states, like you or I, we see her pick that up and we know immediately what she's going to do with it. And for him, if I'm correct, then in my reminiscence of what he said, and I think for the purposes of our conversation, it's okay if I'm wrong, that we are justified in, 
in believing that mental state language is here to stay and mental states are here to stay because we need them to make predictions about very real things in the world. And what I'm wondering with regard to metaethics, similar to this question, or similar to this scenario that I've just painted, is because we sort of require an understanding of human morality to interpret human behavior, make predictions, explain what's happened in the past, does that serve as any sort of justification for being a realist about there being moral facts? Right, good. So, I mean, you got to distinguish, uh, you know, people's beliefs about what's right and wrong from facts about what's right and wrong and which would be doing the explanatory work. And so famously, Gilbert Harmon thought it's just the first. To explain why people do what they do, all you got to know is basically what they believe um, and what they're capable of doing. Um, but Nicola Sturgeon, uh, in a careful analysis of kind of how causal claims work and explanatory claims work, made a, you know, surprisingly impressive case that, no, it seems like actually moral facts play a role. Like, um, so... Play a role in... In explaining behavior. Um, and explaining events in the world generally that are, that are empirically observable. So, you know, um, why did some government collapse, you know, a combination of poverty and injustice, you know, or something. Um, uh, and, um, and there's a million things to say about this debate. It's a very influential debate, it's known as the Harbin Sturgeon debate. Um, uh, there's a million things to say about the debate, but um, the, 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 maybe the important issue that you have to get to the bottom of if you want to figure out what you believe about it is what it takes to be um, a causally explanatory uh, ex, uh, a, a causally explanatory hypothesis and and the, the 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 tricky thing is and this is was Sturgeon's main point it's natural to test whether or not something plays a causal role by counterfactual factually conditionalizing on its falsity and seeing if the thing still would have happened. Mm -hmm. But the moral supervenes on everything else, meaning that you can't vary the moral facts without varying the other facts. So you automatically get the counterfactual dependence because had the moral facts been different, the natural facts would have been right. different and our beliefs would have... So if that's the test, you always get this causal relevance for supervenient facts. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you might say that the, the distinction between what are called epiphenomenal facts and causally efficacious supervenient facts dissolves. You, uh, you, you know, you, you, I know your interest in philosophy of mind and you're familiar with uh, uh, epiphenomenal dualism, the mm -hmm. idea that there are mental or phenomenal properties or facts over and above all the facts about, you know, neurons and so forth, our nervous Which systems. Which I'm not sympathetic to. Right, okay. I'm not sympathetic to Daniel Dennett's position either. I see. I, I just find it interesting. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, there's here's the key point. There's supposed to be logical room for that view. You might think it's false, but there seems to be a view according to which there are... Um, mental facts, let's call them, uh, phenomenal facts, but they're causally inert. But here's the problem. They'd supervene on the causally efficacious facts. And how do we test causal effic efficacy except in the counterfactual way that'll make it right. always the case that supervenience guarantees. So the delicate and interesting and, you know, the issue that has implications beyond metaethics in this debate is what do we mean when we say that something plays an explanatory role in a theory? Because, yeah, and when you, when you qualify it with a theory, that's very important mm -hmm. because obviously a purely psychological explanation is going to be very different from um, something in math or science or, I mean, are, are you following me? You're looking no, no I'm, I, yeah, maybe you can elaborate. I'm not sure what, what you're talking about. 
So I've lost my train of thought again. <laughs> so I, I guess that happens when I'm, yeah. when I'm cornered on my own podcast. No, it's a, make sure that stays. <laughs> this one? Yeah. This I, one? I, I, yeah. I won that. Yes, yeah. you, you won that. Um, okay. We have, I think, had a very substantial conversation about a lot of topics. So before I let you go, have more, are you going to have bagel bites tonight? I think I'm out. Okay. But it might make a trip. I've time. never had bagel bites, but I actually have a list of tomato foods that I need to try. Oh, so you're just now like, I mean, have you had spaghetti? I, I kind of had spaghetti. You got to have spaghetti. Yeah, I've, I've got lots of things. I need to have barbecue sauce. I need to have breadsticks with marinara. For sure, yeah. Um, but bagel bites are, I'm adding that to the list. Yeah. Because... There are lots of things that I've always seen commercials for mm -hmm. that I never got to eat. Like, I really want to try DiGiorno's. Because I've seen DiGiorno's yeah. frozen pizza. I, no. I've seen those commercials my entire life. I really want DiGiorno's. I want tacos. I want... Yeah. I've never had ketchup. I'm curious oh, what, wow. what ketchup is That's like. That's like a food group. That's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yikes. Okay. Uh, yeah, you gotta have a hot dog with ketchup. Ketchup with fries. I need to have that. That's true. Chili. I guess so. Yeah, but anyway, um, I actually found some tomato hard candies. Weird. Yeah, at H Mart. Never even heard. That's amazing. Yeah, so they're from somewhere in Asia. <laughs> but lightheartedly to finish the podcast. So what are your top three ice cream flavors? <laughs> so is Rocky Road a top, it's, or you've just been it's eating unstable. it regularly? It's, honestly, it's an indeterminate. It's indeterminate. I really like cotton candy ice cream flavors. Oh, that's interesting. I, but I, I, it's a hobby that you, you aren't aware of because you don't follow me on Instagram. But I'm not I, on Instagram. You are Instagram? I'm not, I'm not on Yeah, I wouldn't have expected. Media. You yeah, don't have no. a, you have a flip phone, right? But it's, uh, that's true. Or you yeah. don't text. But I eat a ridiculous amount of candy by oh, normal me too. standards. Oh, okay. Well, so then we should talk about candy, actually, because I'm a, I'm a serious con candy connoisseur. Can we talk about candy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, if you're so willing to talk about some more about candy. I would like to talk about candy. So, okay. first question is, now I get to interview you, runs, one to ten. I have rated them out of a hundred, and I can tell you my actual score. Okay, what's the score? Yeah. Runs. Yeah. I'll tell you right now, though, that I really like them. And runs, I gave a 90 on <laughs> August 16th, 2020. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's okay. So I, the scale in which, that I use is 25 is bad. 50 is saltines. So m complete mediocre. Okay. 75 is good. So 90 is like very good. I rarely give a 90, but I, I fucking love runs. Yeah. They're amazing. You can swear when we're talking about candy. Okay. Awesome. Okay. How about sour gummy bears? That is an ambiguous question because runs are made by Ferrara, but there are, are many varieties of sour gummy bears. So you'd really have to qualify the brand. Yeah. So which the, I'm thinking, of but the I ones, can, yeah. but I can tell you though, that I would probably give most sour gummy bears in the 70 to 83 range. I see. So ranging from, I like these to right. these are pretty good. Okay. Interesting. So what's, is there anything that gets a hundred for you? Candy wise? Yeah. Um, you know, there are things that have gotten really close candy wise. Uh -huh. There is a sour, so they're not gummy bears. But a sour raspberry fish gummy from oh, that Sweden. Nice. Ooh, that, that sounds is great. Super good. The brand, or it might be Finland. The brand is Kohl's Fart. Okay. <laughs> in in case you ever want to get them. Okay. Uh, and then I do really like milk duds and Whoppers. Sometimes, it's been a long time sometimes they're milk. bad. So like Whoppers can be really stale, and so can and then you they're like chewy. They're not crunchy, and mm -hmm. it's the same with. Uh, milk duds they can be hard mm -hmm. but when you get some good milk duds and some good whoppers I agree with that. they're really but I'm 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 just getting a sense now that you have real lowbrow food tastes which <laughs> I, I'm also really into so one of oh, the perfect hundreds I've given is Captain Crunch with berries oh yeah, yeah. no Captain so, Crunch <laughs> yeah oh. so I so I rate all of these things but uh, qua food category uh, you say quay right 
I say qua. Is that not oh, you how do? you're supposed to say? I say oh. qua, but I've heard people say qua. But qua cereal? Yeah. I'm, I'm big into sugary cereal, so t- yeah, let me know yeah, what yeah, else yeah. you recommend. Because yeah, I'm all about... Yeah, yeah Captain Crunch with berries, of so course. qua cereal. I give that 100. I think that's wow. god cereal. If there's a that is amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. Um, not I like regular Captain Crunch a lot too, but something that I've been I haven't done it lately, but you can buy the Lucky Charms marshmallows by themselves. No way. Yeah. And I'll just Why? have huge bowls of marshmallows. How of cereal is marshmallows. That now be- better known. Where do you buy that? Uh, you can just go on Amazon. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. I I've gotten like ten pound bags of them and this is hilarious. I have yeah. a I have a good friend uh, in Birmingham. His name's Alex Silk, and we um, we basically like hook each other up with candy and let each other know about like new connections um, for like you know uh, like I found, I got a new connect. Um, if you order from eBay and this, you can get some really amazing. Okay, candy. I know all of these things. Oh, so um, I don't want to end the conversation right now. Now that mm-hmm. we're talking about candy, but. Um, on a subsequent podcast, maybe before I move in May, uh, I could bring some candy and we could rate and have, we could rate candies, taste candies and have like a, a less intense podcast. Episode. Yeah, no, I mean, well, it might be as intense. Actually, yeah, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. With, with, I interviewed Petru and we had, we split between us three pints of ice cream and two chocolate bars. Nice. Yeah. We did three chocolate ice creams. Uh, that's fair. I really like chocolate ice cream, even though I'm big into texture in it. Yeah. In my ice cream, I love the chocolate ice cream. And then we did two chocolate bars because he's really into chocolate. What kind of chocolate bar? You mean just chocolate chocolate bar? Yeah, we did a. <clears throat> we did Cadbury's Royal Dark Chocolate Bar, which was pretty good. Mm-hmm. And then we did. Oh, what, what I liked about that one was, it reminds me of Toll House chocolate chips. Oh, yeah. Do you know what Nestle Toll House is, right? Of course. Yeah. yeah. Petru didn't know what that was because he's Romanian. <laughs> what? Yeah, missing out. So they remind me of Toll House chocolate chips, or that chocolate bar did. Mm, and yum. Yeah. I, I eat chocolate chips on many nights of the week. Really? Yeah. I'm a fan of that. Yeah. And then we did a, a dark chocolate Toblerone. Okay, I'm 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 only now learning about dark chocolate. I don't like dark chocolate okay. that much. I much prefer regular chocolate. Right. But I... I My consume, wife's big into dark chocolate, you know, like that kind of stuff, so I'm learning. But. I treat this very seriously. Yeah. So I, I eat all candies, okay. even if I don't like them, and ice creams. Right. Like I, Just out of obligation? It is. So, yeah. for instance, uh, I lived in Texas for, before this, oh. and there's a brand of ice cream called Bluebell there. Oh, yeah. No, I've had Bluebell. You have? I know Do they have it Bluebell. in Ohio? Or? Um, let's see. Where did I have Bluebell? It must be Ohio, yeah. See, I don't. I'm not going to lose my train of thought when we're talking about no, ice cream. No, but because I am an authority on these things, yeah. Okay, I, I, re- right. I really feel that I am. I right. worked in a candy store for a few years no too. No way. Yeah. yeah. So I'm. I know the candy, the candy world. But when I, so wow. when I was in Texas, I bought. I've probably rated like 40, 50 flavors of Bluebell. Just every flavor they have, I will yeah. get, even if I know I'm not going to like it, I and see. I'll eat the whole pint. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, I've had a lot of bluebell in my life, and it must be from Ohio. I can't even remember now. It must be all when I was living. Do you life. know any flavors that you like? <laughs> um, I actually don't remember the. I don't remember the. What uh, are there specific flavors that they're like known for or something? It's it's been since I was eighteen. Uh, well, they have a lot of special flavors, so that they'll that are seasonal. So they'll have. Oh yeah, that's red right. velvet cake or crazy cookie. Oh dough. yeah, so I, I remember crazy cookie dough was good. It was like a. A tie-dye sugar cookie dough I think ice cream. I, I think I remember both those, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. But they invented... Maybe it's chocolate chip cookie dough. But they have... They have oh, cookie dough two-step is cookies and cream with cookie dough. Oh. So that's a good one. That's a great yeah. idea. But I... Re- I'm going to look up and sh- tell you which ones my favorite were. Yeah. Because I have very rigid, hierarchically organized notes... Uh, it's very okay. surprising. I wouldn't have pegged you for a candy connoisseur. Really? Okay. I, I had generally think of them as aristocrats. Okay. And, uh, today I can tell you what candy I've had before oh, I go into this. Okay. So today I had. Uh, have you heard of the brand Pascas? 
I don't think I so. I think it might be an Israeli brand. Okay. But it might might even be made in New York. But they make a lot of gummy things, and they make sour straws. And I had their green apple <laughs> sour straws today. Oh, the sour straws are great. Which okay. were really good. Nice. And then I had these Asian peach hard candies. I have hard candy when I write because... Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, and then... I had cookies for breakfast. <laughs> nice. What kind so, of cookie? So that, what kind uh, of sugar cookies my mom sent for Easter. Oh, yum. Yeah, yeah. Some were frosted. Some were uh, just sugar covered, but they were really good. Anyway, so Bluebell. Man, br- I need to get a mom who sends me cookies. Yeah. yeah. That sounds great. My mom still sends me an Easter basket, which but is awesome. Are you serious? Yeah. Can, can, can I mean, we share moms? Yeah. Like- I'll... Maybe, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, bride's cake got a ninety-three. Oh, Christmas cookies got a ninety-nine. That one was amazing. Christmas cookies. Wait, yeah, uh, that's a bluebell. Yeah, it was a it was a special Christmas flavor of ice cream. It was like a a green. It was a green ice cream. It had swirls though of. Snickerdoodle and sugar cookie dough and regular cookie dough wow. and icing. So wow. that one that one was awesome. Confetti cake got a ninety five. Cotton mm-hmm. candy got a ninety. I there, don't love the cotton candy stuff as much as uh, you, but I do. Uh, Rocky Road got a sixty six. Ouch. Oh yeah. Okay. And is that my lowest for them? To be just to be clear to defend myself about the Rocky Road, I'm not. Oh, Black Walnut got a twenty. What's <laughs> so, Black Walnut? Uh, I, I think it was just like a walnut base with yeah. walnuts in it, and, and it was just foul. No, that's I mean, bad. a 20 is really bad. That's definitely the worst ice cream score I've ever given. Yeah, well, so just to defend myself about the Rocky Road, the only reason I've been limiting myself lately is because I'm lazy and we live above a grocery store. And so I, I eat what they have, and okay. they have a very limited selection, which is like usually cookies and cream chocolate vanilla rocky road and then usually some other one and what brand is this rocky road gosh what's the brand Edie's. okay Edie's is i ha- actually haven't rated any Edie's though I, because i haven't had any in the last two years i see or three years when i started doing this when i started taking my right. my candy much more seriously but i used to eat Edie's slow turned vanilla at home a lot when yeah. I was like a kid. Yeah, no, that's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, okay. Did you have any more candy questions for me? Because <laughs> um, we went over. We went. Did you love runts? Was that the point? I love runts. Yeah. yeah. Um, I love that. That's like a whole genre of candy where it's like a, a hard like compressed powder thing. Exactly. I love those. I do I too. And here's something them. else I do. I put them in the freezer, so they're extra hard. That's good. I've never done that with. And runs. also. I like the, if I'm like have coffee, it's nice to have the cold. This is what I used to, as a grad student, here's what I used to do every, every day. Okay, I was hot living, tip. I was living in the Lower East Side with three other philosophers. And there's a place that may still exist, I haven't even checked. It's the grossest place that still exists in Alphabet City, which is an ice cream and french fry stand only. And it's back from the days when, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> Tompkins Square Park was like, you know, uh, a mess and uh, and it's the same guy running it he sometimes gets written up like in the paper because he's like still uh, I think uh, I assume he's still there anyway and they he, he, the, all the ice cream slow churned and it's probably like you know made out of like I don't know plastic but anyway so I would get a enormous slow churned uh, chocolate vanilla ice cream cone with rainbow sprinkles and a big old coffee and I would just walk to yeah. NYU. <laughs> and that was my breakfast every morning. And I got to tell you, people talk all about, you know, like kale smoothies or whatever. I'm not into that. It didn't work better than my ice cream cone. No. I, we're both svelte, svelte youngish men. And I think this is us. This is the start of our, <laughs> yeah. our candy diet empire. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. No, we need to, yeah. Like, is it Tom, Tom Brady has his own, like, book? We'll yeah. Make, we'll make a book. Yeah, I actually thought for a, for a while about writing a a comedy book called like uh, like the tapeworm diet or yeah, something totally. like that. There's, people used to tell me I have a tapeworm. So I I mean this might be <clears throat> TMI, but I had, you literally have a tapeworm. <laughs> I literally have had salmonella though, and oh. so 
I, I wasn't going to write the tapeworm diet. I was going to write the salmonella diet because I got salmonella and it was just like a week of me not being able to eat and sitting on the toilet. And it was just absolutely heinous. Yeah. But a good way to lose weight. Yeah. And with that, yes. thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for uh, being on my podcast. Thanks my for first, having me. My first big fish. <laughs> That's right. Yeah.